Good morning and happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Would you come to your feet and together let us lift up shouts of praise to our great Father above who sent His Son Jesus to provide our redemption through His blood which brought forgiveness of our trespasses. We have life because Jesus laid down His. Let's worship Him this morning. Jesus is called the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom we also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So we sing a song and we're going to sing a song in a moment called Cornerstone. And and this word, I uh, was kind of wanting to do a little bit of a deep dive and, and truly understand what this is actually saying. Now, in constructing a, a home, the cornerstone itself is, is 
The first stone set in the foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone. This stone determines the position of the entire structure. And as followers of Jesus, he is to be our cornerstone. He is the one who should determine the position of everything that is in our life. So we're going to continue to praise our Jesus, our cornerstone, the rock of our salvation. And let's, let's thank our great God for loving us and working in and through our lives. is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust, I dare not trust the sweetest friend. Searing lost 
The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, yes, his death and resurrection. God, we boast in you. We boast in you alone. Lord, I thank you that we can be so confident to do that, that we can sing out and declare that you took and paid the ransom that we deserve to pay. God, thank you for being so merciful. Thank you for loving me when I do not deserve that type of love. So I thank you, and I pray that you would speak to us, speak to every person in this room And I pray that our hearts would break, but our hearts would be excited knowing that you loved us so much that you went and paid the price for us. So God, we thank you. We're here for you and you alone, and we pray this in your wonderful, amazing name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Hey, dads. You know, it's really good to see you. I know you may not hear this a lot, but uh, we love you. And we hope you understand how important and how special it is that you're here. You know, there's probably a hundred things you could be doing today, but you're here with us, and it means a lot. You don't have an easy job. Parenting comes with incredible challenges, and sometimes it's hard to know if you're doing it right. But you should know that being here right now, it's an important part. In the Old Testament, God gave this command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. These words that I command you today should be on your heart. 
You should teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house or when you're walking down the street. Talk of them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall asleep at night. So what does it mean to be a good father? It means loving God with all of your heart, soul, and might, and teaching your kids to do the same. And what an amazing example it is that you're here in the house of God, in the presence of other believers, seeking more of Jesus and worshiping unashamed. The young men and women here see you. The kids are watching, and as they grow, they'll remember and do the same. So thank you, dads. Thank you for your presence and example. We pray that God will bless you today, renew your spirit, and draw you closer to Him so you can continue to be a shining influence to all those around you. Happy Father's Day. Yes, happy Father's Day to all the dads here with us in the room as well as uh, joining us online. And uh, like, like the video said, it's powerful and it's meaningful that you are here to encounter God uh, with God's people uh, in some format or another. And so way to go, dads, for, for making this a priority. And uh, I know my, my dad's in our online community today, and so happy Father's Day to you, Dad. I, your card is on the way, I promise. And, uh, you know, it's hard to remember those things for me. But uh, no, happy Father's Day again. You know, um, there are many layers to that one word, dad, right? It, it looks different uh, on each man. But I do think there are some, some commonalities that a lot of dads share. Not everybody, but a lot of dads might share these. Or maybe it's just me, and I, and I hope there's some other, some other folks out there like me, right? Uh, but I think one of those commonalities is a, an appreciation for multi-purpose tools and items, Right? If I can get more than one use, more than one purpose out of something, that just elevates the value of it greatly in my life and in, in my mind. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of multi-purpose tools and items out there. Uh, one in, cre- in particular, though, that stands out as kind of a monument to the multi-purpose genius is what they call the spork. <laughs> it's beautiful, Right? It is just a it's a it's a it's a beautiful work of melding design and and use together uh, into one item, and uh, it, it's got a rich history which I actually spent time researching uh, for this. Right, uh, the spoon has been used for thousands of years. Um, you know, it goes way 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 back in history. For some reason, the fork has only been around for hundreds of years. I don't know what took so long to come up with the fork, but it was hard for us. And then it took a really long time to put the two together, all right? The first even evidence of the spork was somewhere in the mid-1800s. And then it wasn't until around 1950-ish that someone patented what we know as the spork today and started producing it. And now every time you go to KFC, you can enjoy and eat with the spork. And uh, it's just a golden age. We'll just say it's a golden age of human history where we live with the spork. You are probably rightfully wondering why are we talking about sporks this morning? Well, beyond its inherent value uh, as a creation and as a genius, uh, I mention it because it is relevant to our passage this morning and our study in the passage this morning. Because like the spork combines the spoon and the fork, I want to take two different thoughts and bring them to the same message. All right, And so as we look through this passage, it's really going to be kind of two mini sermons rather than one you know, regular length sermon. It'll still be the same length. It'll just be two separate thoughts, which in preaching class they tell you not to do, but they're not here today, so we're going to do it anyway. And uh, the first thought is this, and here's the reason why, because both of these thoughts I've, are so worth it in my heart and in my mind, and I didn't want to sacrifice either, so we're just going to do both. And the first one deals with this particular moment in church history. As we look at Acts chapter 15, this is a pivotal moment for the church. And, and, and we need to understand what was so pivotal about it because it reverberates even in our lives today. It informs how we should function as Stafford Crossing Community Church, and it informs how we should live our lives as disciples of Jesus. So we can't pass that up. But it's also Father's Day. And I, I also want to draw out some principles that the disciples in Acts chapter 15 show us about what it means to be uh, a strong father as a disciple of Jesus. And so we can, we can pull those two things out. So we'll, we'll, we'll first just look at this moment 
what is it about this big moment in the history of this disciple-making movement, and what do we need to learn from that? And in this moment, the disciples are confronted with a, a question. What does it, what's required to be saved? What is required for someone to be saved? And they affirm for this church, for this movement, that this is all about Jesus and Jesus only. That salvation, that this church, that this movement, that our message, the hope of the world is all about Jesus and Jesus only. One of the things we have to remember about this disciple-making movement, right, was that uh, the roots of this movement that we're still a part of, that we're continuing, our roots go all the way back to the beginning of time. The church, the disciple-making movement, was not a late addition by God into, you know, his plans for humanity. It wasn't that, oh, well, you know, they, they messed it up in this, and then that didn't work, and this didn't work. All right, we'll try the Jesus plan. All right, this has been one plan that God has been orchestrating and laying out throughout all time. And, uh, and I, let me just show you this super simple timeline to help us kind of get the broad scope of it. So this is, this is the whole history of the world right? Past, present, and future, all on this line. And uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things here. And it begins, as you might imagine, at creation, right? Where all things were right and good, and mankind list, uh, lived in, in harmony and unity with all things. Some time passes, and, and everything gets messed up when humanity rebels against God and says, we understand what you want us to do, God, but we are going to do this instead. And they break everything when they sin. And they introduce sin into creation. And in that very moment, when everything's fracturing and, and falling apart, God gives us the first hint of what his larger plan is to address this tragedy. In Genesis 3.15, he promises, he says, one day there will be one who will overcome Satan, who will overcome death, who will overcome sin. And from that moment on, God's plan of redemption is set into motion. The next major development in this plan is, is where he would establish the nation of Israel through the man named Abraham. And that obviously took uh, you know, centuries and centuries for a whole people group to develop from Abraham, from this one ancestor. But through them, God was able to reveal himself to the world through their worship of him, through the law that he gave to them, through their relationship to him as their God. He was revealing himself. And then the people of Israel, the Israelite nation, would be the conduit of God's greatest revelation to mankind in the person of Jesus. And Jesus was the fulfillment of what God was promising, hinting at back in Genesis 3.15, that Jesus was the one that would come, that he would destroy Satan, he would overcome evil and death and sin, and he would establish a kingdom of righteousness and, and purity again, and, and all things would be in harmony, just not right then. Surprisingly, Jesus would first act through his own death and then his resurrection. And then Jesus would send out his followers, which includes us today, as his ambassadors into this broken, fractured world where we can share the good news of Jesus and be a part of his restorative work in this broken world until the day that he comes back. And so we are now in this church age where his disciples and this disciple-making movement that we call church is working and serving God in this broken world to bring the good news and restoration. At some point, we don't know when, Jesus will return and the end will come, the end of things as they are now. And he will institute that kingdom here where all things are right, where there is no sin, there is no pain, there is no death, there is no sorrow. All things will live in harmony again. So that is a super quick and simple overview of all of human history. You're welcome. And this, the challenge in this, and the reason we're even talking about this, is, is that the challenge for the people that we're reading about in the book of Acts, and honestly, sometimes even for us, is, is how do we incorporate what we understand of life and understand of God with our faith? And in, the, in Acts, they were really dealing with, okay, we've related to God for centuries this way, as the people of Israel. And we've got the laws, and we have our traditions, we have our customs, and now Jesus is changing some of that. And we get it, we believe in Jesus, but how do we reconcile the two? How do we, can we bring them together? Do they go together? 
For those who rejected Jesus' teaching, they said, well, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. They viewed his followers, the church, us, as branching off into a different direction, that we are not a part of God's plan, that we have broken off and we've headed off into a false religion and we're following this Jesus is, does not honor God. But even within the movement, those, those Jewish people who did trust in Jesus, there was still some struggle to reconcile the old way with Jesus' way. Some, like Peter, handled it pretty well God, through God's grace and God's you know, power of Jesus. Uh, Peter turned the corner pretty quickly. Others struggled much more, and it was much harder for them. And they were constantly trying to reach back to the old ways and, and import that into their faith in Jesus. And then, so that was tough enough, but then God starts to bring in Gentiles into the church. And everything just goes crazy because these Gentiles, they have none of that shared heritage and, and they've got different thoughts and different ways of living. And, and the tension and the complexity in the church just explodes, which brings us to Acts chapter 15 and where they're dealing with this question of what is required for someone to be saved? In verse 1, we read this of Acts chapter 15. It says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And everything hangs on those four words, last four words, you cannot be saved. This teaching was importing requirements from the old way, from the law of Moses, uh, for how they have lived for centuries and trying to import that into their faith and understanding of Jesus and what it means to be saved. In the following verses, Paul and Barnabas would argue strongly against this teaching. And then the church, through all of this, decides, we need some help with this, we've got to figure this out. And so they send a delegation down to the apostles in Jerusalem to help them settle the matter. Because this was not an easy thing for them to figure out. And that, that delegation goes and they make their presentation. They say, this is our problem, help us out. And it says this in verse 5, Then, so we're in Jerusalem, then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, right? So they are Pharisees, but they're also followers of Jesus. That's, that's kind of a tough thing. And they said this, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. They, got, they were fully on board with that. Like, yes, this sounds genius. You see, when it was mostly just a Jewish movement, when it was mostly just Jewish people that were a part of this church, this disciple-making movement, things like circumcision and following the law of Moses was not really an issue. No one really argued about that because they were all Jewish, and that's just what Jewish people did. It was so deeply a part of their heritage that even though they were followers of Jesus, they were still uh, uh, following these different commands and different traditions, and, and, and it worked. But then, as Gentiles were included, things got tense because these Gentiles come from a very different background and they were not necessarily interested in a late in life circumcision scenario. And the law of Moses was not part of their heritage. It wasn't an assumption that they were going to follow this rule and this rule and do this and this and not do that over here. And so they're like, listen, we want to believe in Jesus, but what are all these rules about? That wasn't, you never, you know, it's kind of like the, the bait and switch. Like you told me Jesus and then now you've got all this other stuff. And so what was required? What did they have to do in order to be saved? And this was not an easy matter for the church to decide. And verse 7 tells us that the, that the Jerusalem council had, quote, much discussion, meaning they, it got heated and it was tense and they were arguing about this and going back and forth. As they worked through it, the final decision that we can celebrate and be so grateful for, Peter sums it up in verse 11 where he says, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are, speaking of the Gentiles. And so through this, they affirm for all people, for all time, that salvation and forgiveness and eternal life is the result of faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. That we are saved by God's grace alone, through our faith alone, in Jesus alone. That our rightness with God is established and sustained by Him and it's access, it's granted to us through our faith in Jesus, period. That there is nothing else needed. And in fact, if we try to add any other requirements, then we ruin the whole plan. So Jesus plus anything gives us nothing. 
When we start adding in requirements and boxes that we have to check in order to be forgiven, in order to be saved, if it's anything beyond faith in Jesus alone, it ruins everything. Well, James goes on and he, he builds on this affirmation uh, and he's, he's, he's there among the apostles and, and elders and, and, and he adds this great piece of wisdom in verse 19. He says, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That is a powerful statement and a cautionary statement for us because it is not our job to put hoops in front of people before they can trust in Jesus, before they can turn to God. Now, this is exactly what the religious leaders of Jesus' day did. In Luke 19, uh, the, the, the religious leaders wanted Zacchaeus to get his life right before they would associate with him. They would say, Zacchaeus, you need to stop being a corrupt tax collector, and then we can hang out together. But Jesus did not hold back. When he met Zacchaeus on the road, he said, let's have dinner. And he went over and hung out at Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus had a radical life transformation because Jesus did not hold back, did not put hoops in front of him. Again, in Luke chapter 7, uh, Jesus is approached by a, quote, sinful woman who was shunned by all religious leaders because of her reputation, because of her, the things she had done. She was not clean. But Jesus welcomed her. Jesus accepted her act of devotion and her act of faith as she came before him, and she left his presence with her sins forgiven. And if Jesus says, come as you are in faith, and I will make you new, then who are we to put hurdles in front of people? Who are we to put roadblocks in front of anyone? So how should this impact us? This is a monumental moment in church history, and it reverberates even to today for us. How should this affect how we operate as a church and how we live as disciples of Jesus? Well, just like the disciples in Jerusalem uh, in this council, we need to affirm these two principles and make sure they never waver in our church and in our lives. And the first one is this, that we are saved by God's grace alone through faith alone in Jesus alone. There is nothing added to that for salvation. For a person to be forgiven, for a person to be granted eternal life by God, there is nothing we can do to make ourselves worthy or deserving of it. It is not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus only that we are saved. And then secondly, we will not make it difficult. We will not make it difficult for anyone to trust in Jesus. We will not put extra hoops or or roadblocks for people to overcome before they can turn their life over to Jesus. Jesus does not expect sobriety before he will accept your faith. Jesus does not expect sexual purity before he will accept your faith. Jesus does not expect clean language or, or you can fill in the blank before he will accept your faith. Now, Jesus wants to do all of those things. He wants to bring sobriety. He wants to bring purity. He wants to bring all of these good things, but not before we put our faith in him. All of those good things come after. There is no get your life right and then come to Jesus. It's come as you are, and God will make you right and grow that in you. And he loves us enough that he accepts us. Whatever your baggage is, whatever your stuff is that you're bringing to Jesus, He accepts us with that stuff. And then he loves us enough to work that out of us, graciously and patiently. And he allows us to be a part of that with one another, that we get to partner together as God is working, as all with the same humility that, that, yeah, I've got my own stuff that God's working, and he's working your stuff out, and and, and we we can partner together with that. And we get to see that in Acts chapter 15 as well. If we skip down to verse 20, um, they've already established, you know, salvation is through Jesus alone. And, and then they say this in verse 20, and James is still talking. He says, we should write to them, the Gentiles, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals and from blood, which to us sounds like a, an extremely odd and random list of things. Like he's just making stuff up, you know, like, and, and not flying kites right? But these were all very relevant to the Gentile life in in the ancient world. Um, And so these are not salvation-related 
instructions. He's not saying, yeah, if you want, if you want to be saved, then you know, no more of the idle food, uh, no more strangled animals. Okay, that's weird. Uh, whatever it is, these are not salvation-related things. These are steps, instructions for the Gentiles to follow so that they can promote the growth and the harmony and the relationships within the church. The Jewish community, they're being instructed, listen, you cannot hold the Gentile believers to circumcision and all the laws that you love, right? You've got to let that go, Jewish believers. Gentile believers, you've got some things you need to let go of in your life, right? Because you're living a new life in Jesus now. And here are some things that you need to let go of, and you need to set these aside so that these two very different groups of people with different backgrounds can come together and can be the church. And so we have these instructions. What about us? Is there anything in these two principles that you need to embrace for yourself? Do you need to embrace the truth that it's your trust in Jesus alone? that you're forgiven and you're given new life and and, and set aside whatever else you're adding, that that plus. Set aside the plus. Well, it's Jesus plus, you know, my my good works. It's Jesus plus my, my good intentions. It's Jesus plus this. No, it's just Jesus. And set that aside so that you can have the freedom that God gives us in Jesus. Or maybe it's uh, some hurdle that someone put in your life or you've put in your own life, some kind of roadblock that says, ah, once I get this figured out, once I get past this in my life, then then I'll I'll come to God. Then I'll be ready to turn to Jesus. And that's so backwards because he's the one that turns around everything that needs to be fixed. Is there a roadblock that you or someone else has put in your life? Can you set that aside? As a church, I think we need to take a hard look at our expectations of people spoken or unspoken, right? What are our expectations? Are are there any uh, roadblocks that we're putting in front of people? Are we making it difficult for people in any way to trust in Jesus? Do we have a culture where anyone can walk in the doors with any baggage that they're bringing in with them and say, yeah, I I belong here. I don't know about Jesus yet, but I, I, I can be here. Or do we have roadblocks that we're put in the way? I think we have relatively few hills that we're willing to die on as a church. Places where we're like, nope, we're going to take this stand and we will not budge. These need to be two of those. That salvation is Jesus alone. It's God's grace alone through our faith alone and Jesus alone. And we will not make it difficult. We will not put obstacles and hurdles in front of people to trust in Jesus. We will make it as clear and as accessible as possible. All right, take a breath. That was one mini sermon. We got one, we got one more, a little bit shorter, I think, maybe, to go. I want to turn this corner and think about this passage through the lens of fatherhood, because this is not just uh, a big moment for the church. There's also some great principles here. And, and I do hope that everyone will continue to listen, uh, because this is good for all of us, but especially for fathers as we think about what that means. So dads, you'll likely have some fathering attributes from your own father that you want to keep, that you want to continue, and maybe some that you want to get rid of. You're like, I do not want to be a dad like that. Um, You might have a different person that you want to be like as a father. That's my role model as a father. Uh, You may have no role model. You may be like, I didn't have a dad or my dad was terrible and I don't even know what a good dad looks like. All right, So there's a spectrum of experience here. But this morning, regardless of where we're coming from, I want us to see that being a disciple of Jesus should be the heaviest and most obvious influence on us as dads. No matter how good or how bad your human father was, being a disciple of Jesus should guide us more and more clearly than any of that. And this is, I mean, this is such a broad truth. There's no way we're going to unpack everything. But in this passage, there's three uh, principles that I want to quickly show us. And one is this, that... um, is found in the opening two verses, right? We've already read in verse one that the disciples went from Jerusalem and they were, you know, the false teaching about salvation. And then verse two tells us this. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. A strong disciple dad, we'll just call them that, disciple dads. A strong disciple dad must know truth and stand for truth. Dads, we gotta know 
truth and stand for truth. And that's a capital T truth, right? This is truth from God uh, and, and, and what God says about life. This is about knowing God's truth and being able to stand in that truth and to lead our families in that truth. It's, it's knowing what God says about the way your family should operate. It's knowing what God says is right and wrong. It's knowing what God says about your finances. It's knowing what God says about your kids' friendships and relationships and, and your own relationship to your wife. Leading our families to know these truths and to live out these truths. And the best way to get stronger and stronger in that is by knowing God's word. By knowing God's word and what God teaches us and God shows us here, what he reveals to us in his word is how we know his truth more and more. And, and it, it happens different ways, right? You're, you're doing that right now. You're encountering God's truth as we worship him, as we hear and engage with his word here together uh, and online. Uh, and so you're, we're, we're engaging God's word together here. It happens as you do this in a, maybe a smaller setting with a small group uh, or a, you know, a few other people for some accountability. It happens you know, as you're doing devotions with your family. You're encountering God's word. You're in ingesting it into your heart, into your mind, and allowing it to direct you. Most importantly, it happens when you are digging into God's Word on your own. As men, as we're sitting there and we're studying God's Word because we want to know Him, we want to understand how we can live and how we can lead our families as we engage with His Word. There's a, one, a, 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 a page on our website with a, a bunch of online study tools, and you can get there through, uh, through the sermon resource page today. Because um, I think a lot, of, a lot of guys will be like, I'd love to dig into God's Word more. I just need a little help, a little guidance. And there are some helpful tools on our website that can direct you to different places where you can do that. But a strong disciple dad must know truth and stand for truth. Secondly, a strong disciple dad um, needs to be a team leader for your wife, not a dictator. Being a strong dad doesn't mean that you're a dictator, but more of a team leader. And the apostles and elders give us a great example of this in verses 6 and 7. It says, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. And after much discussion, right, that was that, that tense discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. He gave them the answer. You see, even though that they lived in a very hierarchical society, where these people are the boss, these people are the next, and then all that is very clearly delineated. And even though the apostles held a very unique role, the undisputed bosses, leaders of the church, as they walked with Jesus, right? even though they had all of that, they chose to involve others, to bring the elders into the conversation. Later on, we'll see they brought the whole church into it at the tail end of it. But they brought it, they made it a team effort. Now, Peter, being the most prominent voice among the apostles, he could have just stood up and said, listen, I already know the answer to this. I've had visions. I remember talking with Jesus about this. Here's the answer. Done. Let's go to lunch. Right? He could have done that. And everyone would have said, okay, he's Peter. He's the boss. Let's go. But he didn't. They made it a team effort. See, too many dads, I think, are acting as poor dictators when they could be such great team leaders with their wives. What's the difference? A dictator is going to call all the shots solo, right? Because they feel like that, that, that's my, I have to do that. That's my power. That's my role. Whereas a team leader invites collaboration. Hey, help me understand this. Help me think this through. What, how, how do we understand this? What do we do with this? They're inviting that collaboration from their wife. A dictator is going to preserve their own power, right? I've got to protect my role and my authority. Whereas a team leader empowers others to thrive. As a team leader, I want to lift up my team. I want them all to win. I want them to thrive. A dictator is going to fear the strength of others because you might be better than me. You might be stronger than me in this way or that way. But a team leader values that strength and wants to elevate and maximize that strength. If our wife is better at this or that, then let's elevate that. Let's maximize that. Be a team leader. And a dictator is going to cultivate fear. That, oh, you know, I got to protect, I have to, to, to uh, protect my role, my authority, my place, my value. A team leader cultivates that mutual respect where we're doing this together. We're on the same team and we're operating as one. See, nowhere in scripture do we see a, a model to follow or teaching for that dictator dad. There's probably some examples in there. You could probably pull out someone that, you know, would lived that way. But that's not God's teaching. That's not the model for us to follow. But Scripture does teach us and show us that dads should treat our wives with gentleness and understanding and sacrificial love, that we should elevate them 
and lift them up. There's examples in scriptures of moms and grandmothers that were incredibly fundamental. They were pillars of faith and in developing and investing in their families. And I think any dad, any dad, would be foolish to suppress or ignore the great value their wives bring to their family. And a disciple dad, a follower of Jesus, absolutely must avoid that. Jesus teaches and shows us a far greater way that we can be that team leader for our wives. And lastly, a strong disciple dad is going to have an intentional spiritual plan for their family. An intentional spiritual plan for the family. See, once the apostles and elders had worked out their response, they brought it to the whole church, right? So they're they're getting everybody involved. They had a good old-fashioned business meeting. And they said, how do we want to go from here? What do we want to do with this? And, And in verse 22 and 23, it says, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. And with them they sent the following letter. So they had written everything out. They wrote out their response to the, the conflict over salvation and then along with the instructions to the, to the Gentile believers. And they sent it with these respected leaders. Now, Paul and Barnabas, they already had the respect of the believers in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas could have delivered this message on their own and it would have worked fine. But the church in Jerusalem wanted to show how seriously they took this matter. And so they delegated some of their great leaders to go and spend some time in Antioch, investing in the church there to deliver the message, right, the response, but also to invest in the church and to build up the church in Antioch because they took it that seriously. A disciple dad it will also take the spiritual life of the family with equal seriousness. Developing a plan, developing that plan with his wife, right, because team leader, and being intentional to execute that plan, to lead the family in that plan. Some, some parts of that plan for your family might be different than my family, right? From family to family, there's going to be some different specifics that might show up. There are going to be some things that are probably universal, things like praying daily for your family, dads, praying daily with your family, bringing up spiritual conversations in the family, that you're the one setting the tone, asking you know, questions or, or leading a family in devotions um, from time to time, building in family habits that promote spiritual growth. Things like that daily prayer uh, or doing family devotions. Things like making uh, uh, regular church participation or kids crossing or, or fusion. Making those habits regular in your family life and building into that. Having a plan, leading that plan with your wife, taking it seriously. Now, if you're a dad like me, the weight of that can be heavy sometimes. Right? And, and it can weigh on you. And, and whenever, that, whenever I'm feeling that, I always know that helpful resources are huge. And the, they can just give me that direction and give me that boost. And, and we've got a ton of resources that we just want to make you aware of. Um, on the sermon resource page, there are books that are listed there. Uh, there are um, devotions that you can do as a dad just to feed into your own heart. There's a podcast you can tune into that's got some great content. Um, there's our at-home resources that we, that we cultivate uh, that uh, are also available on, on the at-home wall in the lobby if you're on campus. And there's other, some some of, some of the online resources are there as well. You can kind of thumb through those books. But just know that your toolbox can be full. And there are a lot of resources and a lot of tools that can help you, and, and we want to come alongside you. In particular, I want to point out one resource that is a little bit unique, because I imagine there may be a dad or two hearing this message, and and you're feeling like, yeah, a book is helpful, a podcast is good, but I I think I need a little bit more than that. Like, I need a little bit of targeted help. Maybe you're encountering a challenge that you never saw coming down the road. Uh, Maybe you're just feeling super isolated, and you're like, I don't know what to do. Am I the only one going through this or dealing with this? Um, Maybe you just have no idea how to be the dad you want to be, and and you're just like, "I, I want someone to talk to. We've identified a a handful of guys that um, are just doing a great job. They're either doing a great job right now raising their kids, or they've raised their kids already, and and we would point you to them. And on the sermon resource page, there's a a link where you can sign up to have a conversation, a phone call, a consultation, if you will, with one of these 
with one of these dads. And you can, you can sign up, and, and it's a private conversation with them. And you can just say, hey, here's, here's my question, or here's my issue, here's my challenge, here's my need, and just have a conversation with someone. And you can read some, inf- some basic information like, oh, this guy was in the military, and so am I. Or, or this guy has got three, three daughters, and I've got daughters. And, and there's some commonality and some connection there. And if you're that guy that you're like, man, I, need some, I, I could really use someone to talk to, then I hope that you'll reach out to them and do that. Sometimes as guys, we can, we can just keep on bleeding, right? Like we know, we know there's a big gash in my arm, and it's obviously bleeding. I just don't want to admit it. And so I'm just going to go on bleeding until I faint and pass out, right? Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Reach out and just say, hey, I'd love to talk to somebody. It's all, it's all you know, online there for you, and you can, you, you've got the information. It is a limited time offer like this. If you come back next year, it's, prob- it's probably not going to be there. Um, so don't, don't delay. I'm, I'm so grateful for Acts chapter 15 because it solidifies for us what does it mean to be saved, right? How, how, what's required of me? And it's my faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone, right? And we can live with the church that that's our passion, that's our heartbeat, that we want people to know that it's your faith in Jesus alone that saves you and God's grace that makes it happen. And we're not going to put those hurdles. We're not going to put obstacles in. You don't have to put a tie on before you get here. You don't have to get right with God before coming here or coming to Jesus. And I'm grateful for the powerful lessons that we see as dads helps, that helps us grow that we can be strong disciples of dad, strong disciple dads, and, and let his presence be the greatest influence in our lives. Because everyone wins. Every family wins when dad is taking his cue from Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. God, thank you for this chapter where you just, again, affirm for your people that salvation is through Jesus alone, that your grace empowers as we respond in, in simple faith and belief that you, you activate forgiveness and eternal life and you save us. God, help us to keep that in our hearts and, and to, to not allow any obstacles or, or hurdles to creep up in our hearts and in our, in our church and in our relationships with people outside. God, help us as dads. Uh, we want to do a great job with our kids. We want to raise them to, to be decent people, most importantly, to know you, to love you and to follow you. And we desperately need your help. God, help us to lean on one another and help us to lean into your word and into your presence as we do that. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Would you call? all come back to your feet? Let us continue to praise our great Redeemer, Jesus.
Celebrate it. There's no other love. 